know that Dr. Aulis needs some chapstick. Man. <laughs> All right. So during today's class, we're going to cover the material in about the first five pages of the lecture lesson number two, which is about the cell. So lecture lesson number two starts with a picture that looks like this. And for my friends who already had lab this week, this should look pretty similar to the models that we worked on labeling together. Uh, so as we're looking at our cell here, uh, apologies if someone has a mic on, I might be hearing an echo. So do me a favor and turn it off for me. Uh, when we look at, at our human cells, to be honest with you, none of them look exactly like this. This is what they like to call the prototypical cell, meaning that it has a little bit of everything, but it doesn't have a lot of anything. All of the cells in your body are specialized to do specific jobs. So some cells will have a bunch of mitochondria. Some cells will have a bunch of ribosomes. Some cells won't have hardly anything in them. So it really just depends what they do. Because hey, remember way back from five days ago when you first met me, I talked with you about anatomy and physiology. We talked about how anatomy is what's there and physiology is what it does. Remind me in the chat, anatomy and physiology, they are or are not related to each other. Anatomy and physiology are or are not related to each other. Exactly. Yep, we remember from last week, the one of the most important ideas the entire semester. Anatomy and physiology are related to each other. If I know the anatomy of something, if I know what's there, I can predict what it might be able to do. And vice versa, if I know what something needs to do, I can predict what needs to be there. So this cell has a little bit of everything and it wouldn't be very good at doing anything. So we're not gonna see cells that look like this on slides. We'll see cells that look different. Regardless, let's go through and talk about what we can see on this cell. So the first organelle that we notice, the biggest one here in the cell is the nucleus. When we talk about the nucleus, think of it kind of like the command center of your cell. It stores all of this stringy stuff that is DNA. Your DNA is the directions for all of the proteins that you make in your body. Uh, it's what helps your cells to function, your DNA. So uh, this is the, like I said, the command center, the control center of your cell. When you have that genetic information and you want to make a protein with it, you're gonna send a special copy of that information out to organelles like this blue one that we see here. This blue one that we see here is called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And the rough endoplasmic reticulum works to build proteins. The way that we know it builds proteins is because of the little brown spots that we see all over it. Those brown spots are things called ribosomes. Ribosomes are my little protein builders. My big protein builders are, is this whole big organelle called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So we can see that some of those ribosomes, those protein builders float around inside our cell. Hey, let me give you an important anatomy term here that might be a little bit different than terminology you've heard before. When we are talking about the fluid that's inside our cell, in your anatomy class, you're gonna call that cytosol. The fluid that fills up a cell is called cytosol. It's possible that in high school or even there's a video that I posted that alas, he incorrectly refers to this fluid as cytoplasm. Technically in anatomy, cytoplasm is not only the soup like we, we see here inside our cell, but the cytoplasm also includes all of the organelles. So Dr. Aulis is never gonna use the cytoplasm word. I'm gonna use the cytosol word because that's the technical name for the soup in your cells. One of the things that the soup has a lot of is proteins. So we can see these proteins here uh, in the line. Some of those proteins are really thick. Um, the proteins that are thick, that kind of stretch all over the place, they make something called the cytoskeleton 
And think of that just like your own skeleton. That means it's, it's the framework for your cell. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna talk about cells that look really funky called neurons. They're all stretched out and they have little branches and all kinds of stuff. That's the work of the cytoskeleton to stretch things out. The other thing that the cytoskeleton does is it acts kind of like a highway system through your cell. So when I need to send messages throughout the cell or pass around food or structures throughout the cell, I will use that cytoskeleton to do that. One of my organelles that, that uses that cytoskeleton a lot is this pink one that we see over here. It's actually ironic that it's pink, right? Because my lab friends, it was pink in lab too. So it's perfect. This organelle that we see right here is called the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is our, our post office of the cell, if you will. It packages up the stuff that comes out of the rough endoplasmic reticulum and it sends it to different places in the cell, or it can even send it outside of the cell if it's something that needs to go out there. So my Golgi apparatus uh, packages and transports things. We talked about these guys in lab today. So my friends from lab know that when we talk about the mitochondria, we don't just say that they're the powerhouse of the cell. That's high school biology. Does any of my lab friends remember, what did we say that the mitochondria do? If we're not saying they're the powerhouse, what was it that we said about them that was a better description of their function? Exactly, yeah. So for the sake of anatomy with Dr. Aulis, when we're talking about the mitochondria, what you need to know about them is that they make this thing called ATP. Here, I'll write that out. ATP. Think about ATP like the energy money of your cell. So starting next week uh, and in the weeks to follow, we're going to talk about how some of the things that your cell does won't happen without help. We need energy help and the energy help we use is ATP. So that's made by my mitochondria. They give me the energy that I need. There are a few other organelles that uh, you should cover uh, in your work through the guided lesson, but those are some of the big ones that, that we see here when we look at this prototypical cell that has a whole lot of everything. When we consider the way that a cell functions, cells are kind of self-contained. They're kind of away from their environment. Theoretically, they could survive on their own kind of like something that is all too uh, too close to home for a lot of us, right? And this is the idea of a quarantine for COVID exposure. So maybe some of us right now are in quarantine because of an exposure to a COVID positive person. Maybe some of us have COVID. Uh, regardless, way back in the beginning of the pandemic, we are all all too familiar with this idea of being quarantined for 10 days. And remember at the very beginning, they were like, hey, when you're in quarantine, stay home, don't spread your germs. So let's consider for a minute, we're going back to early pandemic days. We've been quarantined and we've got 10 days that were locked inside our house. Or maybe we'd say even that you're locked inside one room of your house because other family members aren't exposed. We wanna keep them, keep them healthy. Let's consider together, what are some of the things, if you had to quarantine for 10 days, what are some of the things that you would need to have with you in, in that room if we were being quarantined for 10 days? Help me out in the chat. What would we like to have? Or what do we need to have? Put it that way. <laughs> we all definitely agree. Yep, we gotta have food and water. Absolutely. Okay. We might want some medicine, yeah, to, to help us feel better. I like it. <laughs> yes, Netflix, right? <laughs> uh, this morning we were saying, yeah, entertainment of all kinds. I, I like that uh, Hayden's mentioning waste management. Uh, we take that for granted, right? We're, we're hoping that the place that, that you're stuck in uh, is not a, a little country house that has no facilities, right? Cleaning supplies. Oh, I feel that, Lizbeth. Starbucks. Yes, please. Uh, I am. I'm. I'm in the point of the day where I need my afternoon coffee, so I. I'm feeling that. 
Yeah, phone. Okay, yeah, communication. So here's here's what I want to briefly do with us. We came up with with some good ideas. I like it. Um, what I want to do with us is take some of these ideas that that we talked about um, and relate them to things that a cell would need. So when we talk about how we wanted food and water, one of the things if you had a chance to work on today's lecture outline, I told you the name of a cell's favorite food. Does anyone remember what a cell's favorite food is? What do they like best? Besides Starbucks, right? <laughs> My cells love Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So several of us are chiming in. A cell's favorite food is glucose. So glucose, uh, you'll see it in your notes outline. It's it's chemistry name that tells us everything that's in it. C6H12O6, that's its chemical name. If I'm a cell and I say I need food, this is the kind of food that I can eat or I can most easily eat. Although I'll mention that there are some cells in the body that that glucose, the sugar, is literally the only thing they can eat. And those are your neurons. Your neurons can only eat sugar, which is why it's so important for you to maintain your blood sugar levels. Your body actually has the ability to turn other foods back into sugar to uh, make sure that you have what you need. So um, we all said we needed food. We probably want more than just glucose, right? <laughs> uh, but if we're a cell, all we need is, is that glucose. Uh, I know we mentioned we wanted something like waste management. I'm not going to write that whole word. Waste management. For my lab friends, or for all of you who had a chance to work ahead, um, we said there was an organelle in the cell uh, that kind of digests intracellular waste or it breaks things down. Do we remember who helps to, uh, to digest stuff that's left over in the cell that we don't need anymore? Yeah, exactly. Yep, so when we think about waste management, whether that's a toilet, whether that's trash service, whatever it's gonna be, that's a lot like how our cells have lysosomes to get rid of the stuff that they don't need anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I did notice too though that some of us also mentioned like cleaning supplies. And I really like that idea as well, cleaning supplies. Because that's a little bit different than just getting rid of your waste, right? That's something that can can get rid of potentially virus or bacteria or whatever it is that's on top of things. Um, I would say that cleaning supplies are maybe a little bit more like an organelle called a peroxisome. The peroxisomes help you to get rid of harmful stuff that's in your cell. So these things called free radicals that like to mess with your DNA, um, they, they help to protect you from those things. So um, I like the idea of cleaning supplies kind of like that. Uh, let me think about some of the other stuff. Hey, something we kind of took for granted, although we mentioned it a little bit with Wi-Fi, for you to be able to have working Wi-Fi, there's something else that you probably also need to have that's working in your house. Any ideas what I might be talking about? What, what do I also need to have for me to be able to use my Wi-Fi? Yeah, exactly, yep. So I also need to have power. Um, for those of you who remember, haven't blocked the memory of Snowpocalypse last year, right? <laughs> uh, it didn't matter if you had Wi-Fi or not when your house is 52. <laughs> So uh, we need to have power. We're hoping that if, if we get quarantined for 10 days, it's not in a place uh, that has no heat or climate control for me. Um, so easy question here, right? If I'm talking about power in a cell, who's the powerhouse? I'll use our, our favorite terms. <laughs> exactly, big long name. My powerhouse is the mitochondria. So I'm gonna wanna have power, right? Um, just like a cell needs to have its ATP, that's the job of the mitochondria. One other thing I'll mention that we, we took for granted a little bit uh, is anywhere we are, we want to make sure that we have air, right? Air fills up every room that we're inside of, unless we're swimming, <laughs> and then the water fills it up. But uh, air fills our rooms. If we're talking about what fills up a cell, cells are not full of air 
but they're full of a fluid that we mentioned with a special name. What's the name of the fluid that I find inside my cells? Do you remember what we said that was called? Exactly. Yep, we're all chiming in. The fluid inside my cells is cytosol. So as you're reviewing the parts of the cell, what they do, what, what they look like, consider the example of what you need when you're locked in for quarantine. A lot of those things that you would need or that you'd want could maybe relate to the kinds of functions that, that the organelles inside of a cell would need to have to survive. Now, when we talk about uh, you being stuck inside a room, uh, we're, we're taking for granted as well the fact that that room has walls around it, something that divides that room from the rest of your house. Or even if you're quarantining inside your house, something that divides your house from the outside world. When we talk about cells, they don't have four walls around them, but what they do have is the thing called the plasma membrane. That's a, another organelle that's on your list. When we talk about the plasma membrane, its function is to be a dividing line, to show us where inside and outside are different from each other. And the reason that's important is because the fluids that I find inside are different from the fluids that I find outside. So we've already said this one a whole bunch. When we are talking about fluids in the body, there's only one fluid that I find inside my cells. That's what intracellular means, inside my cells. That one fluid is called cytosol. So cytosol is the one intracellular fluid that we have in the body. Everything else we would call extracellular, outside of the cells. And when we're talking about extracellular fluids, the name really comes down to where I'm finding it. It's outside of a cell, perfect. But what is it inside of, or what is it next to? So the first extracellular fluid to mention here is plasma. When we talk about plasma, this is the extracellular fluid that is outside of our red blood cells, but inside of our blood vessels. So if you've ever donated blood, when you donate blood, you are, are giving not only the little cells that live inside your blood, but also the plasma that's inside there as well, the liquid that's inside there. If we're not inside a blood vessel, maybe we're just chilling out in your tissues. So this morning I gave the example, if you look at your forearm, you can see your blood vessels. So the fluid inside there is the plasma. But everywhere else where we're, we're touching, we just have a lot, of, a lot of tissue around here, lots of cells with proteins mixed in, not a blood vessel. The fluid that I find outside of cells, but inside of tissues, the tissues of my body, those, uh, that fluid is called interstitial fluid. So in between my cells that are found in tissue, that's interstitial fluid. All of these, uh, these fluids are found in different places in the body and they do slightly different jobs depending on where they're found. Yeah, I see a couple of us uh, noting in, in the chat, yeah, you, you can actually just donate plasma as opposed to uh, donating blood and they do pay you for that. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about in a moment one, what's in plasma, which is why you can actually sell your plasma. Um, Dr. Aulis has done that at one point in her life. I was a, uh, a poor graduate student myself, so <laughs> I, uh, I know about that. <laughs> when we are looking at the fluids of the body, we do not have the same amount of fluid of each kind of fluid in different places in the body. Um, so when we're looking at this graph to help us figure out um, where we have different kinds of fluid in the body, uh, this is what we call a pie chart. A pie chart is whatever the biggest piece of the pie is, we have the most of that. The smallest pieces of the pie, we have less of that. So let's start up here. My biggest piece of the pie 
is intracellular fluid. That's the way that they, they labeled it here on my graph. But remember, I have a special name for intracellular fluid. This is the one kind of fluid that I find inside my cells. Can you remind me in the chat, what's the name that Dr. Aulis is mostly going to use for intracellular fluid? What's my main, well, actually it's not my main, it's my only intracellular fluid. Exactly, yep. So when I ask you what fluid we have the most of in the body, the fluid that we have the most of in the body is cytosol. Most of the fluid, over 50% of the fluid in your body is inside your cells. After that, we find it in a lot of different places outside of the cells. So interstitial fluid, as we see here, that's my next most common one. And remind me, interstitial fluid, it's outside of my cells, but it's inside of, does anyone remember what I said? I find interstitial fluid. Yeah, exactly. Interstitial fluid is inside my tissues. I remember tissues is what most of what your body is made out of. It, it's basically everything that's not, it, when you put a group of cells together, we call those cells a tissue. So most of your body is tissues. The fluid that's in most of your body that's not in a cell is inside, inside interstitial fluid. But then we've also got plasma, right? And plasma was the one that was inside your blood vessels. Not gonna write all of that, but blood vessels. And then notice that our last category when we look at this pie chart is other fluids. And this last slice of the pie is very small, but also this is the slice of the pie that has the most names. It kind of reminds me of how like chihuahuas are the smallest dogs, but they make the most noise. That's this little piece of pie here. It's like, I have 20 million names. I don't care that I'm so little of the fluid in the body. I have my own name. So you're gonna read about a lot of those, those different fluids, uh, things like lymph, or here's one that I'll, I'll ask you about. Um, who can remind me where we find synovial fluid? We talked about synovial fluid in lesson number one, synovial fluid. Yeah, exactly. So synovial fluid is one of these mysterious other fluids that I see over here. Synovial fluid is the fluid that we find in the joints, yeah, like Jessica said, that are movable. So synovial fluid is what we have in the finger joints, allowing those, those bones to move. Whereas when we look at our skull, our skull doesn't have any movement. It, it is stuck in place because we have what are called sutures up here no synovial fluid. So synovial fluid is found in joints. We have things like uh, lymph fluid that's found inside lymphatic vessels, or there's one called cerebrospinal fluid that's by your brain and spinal cord. Long story short, this other fluid category has a lot of different fluids in it. We don't have very much of any of these fluids, uh, but they are important. They each have their own name. So what do I want you to know from this graph? I want you to know from most to least, how much do we have of these, these different fluids? Jaquandra's not too, uh, too happy about this, sorry. Or either that or the dog wants pie. <laughs> Hard to tell, that's for sure. <laughs> In addition to knowing what I have the most of, uh, I also am going to need to know the recipes for each of these things. So when Dr. Aulis says recipes, what I mean is uh, if you were to try to mix up some of this fluid in a bowl on your, your desk in front of you, what would you need to put inside of it? So there's three fluids in the body that you need to know the recipe for. You would need to be able to mix up for me. So the first one is the intracellular fluid. Remember, that's our cytosol. The next one is interstitial fluid. That was the one that was in between the tissues. And finally, I want you to know the recipe for plasma as well. So when I look at this graph, this is an example of a bar graph. On bar graphs, how tall a bar is helps me to know um, 
when I have a lot of it. So for example, over here, I've got two really tall bars. These two really tall bars tell me that I have a lot of this thing in those fluids. So this thing that I have a lot of, my first thing in my recipe is Na+, that's sodium. I have a lot of sodium in my interstitial fluid and in my plasma. Now on your sheet, you have extracellular fluid broken up into two parts. So you've got one that says interstitial fluid and one that says plasma. I'm a little outdated, I apologize, but we're gonna wanna circle sodium for both of them. Both of these fluids, plasma and interstitial fluid, have a lot of sodium in them. These two fluids also have a lot of chloride in them. We go to the bottom of our graph. Lots of chloride in interstitial fluid and in plasma. The next thing in my recipe book is potassium. K plus is potassium. Notice with K plus, with potassium, now the bar that's biggest is this beige one. This beige bar represents my intracellular fluid or my cytosol. The fluid inside your cell has a whole lot of potassium. Notice it doesn't have a whole lot of sodium or chloride. Those bars were little. Not very much of that, but a whole lot of potassium. The other thing that my proteins have a whole lot of, or excuse me, that my, that my cytosol has a whole lot of is proteins. See how I've got a tall bar up here for proteins. Notice though that the other fluid that has a good amount of, of proteins inside of it is my red bar here, it's plasma. So this is why I split things up in your notes because proteins, not very much of them in interstitial fluid, but there is a lot of them in plasma. Plasma has a lot of proteins. Do we remember from our notes, um, what do those proteins in plasma do? There's a couple of reasons that your, your blood's fluid needs to have proteins in it. Anybody remember? Yeah, so one of the things we've chimed in about is making your blood clot. Yeah, that's a good thing, right? Because if we get a paper cut, we don't wanna bleed forever. We wanna bleed until we make a clot and then we're, we're safe. Um, so yeah, so Jaquandra mentioned about giving shape to things. Um, that would be inside a cell, it does that. Uh, but when we're floating around outside the cell, um, it doesn't help as much with, with that. The other thing that, um, yeah, so that Lisa's mentioning, having to do with um, why you can get money for your plasma, uh, is because of the things that we give to immunocompromised people. These proteins in your plasma, yeah, they're called antibodies. Or if, if you're in an, a uh, microbiology class, you might call them immunoglobulins. So these are the proteins that, that are, are the flags your body puts on bacteria or viruses. They're called antibodies. So the reason that plasma needs a lot of proteins, we need to make sure that you don't bleed out. So some of them are clotting factors. We also need to make sure that if there are bad guys floating around in your bloodstream, we see them so that we can attack them. So that's why plasma has proteins in it. Your tissues don't need to do those things. So they're not gonna have as, as many proteins inside of them. Wanna pause for a moment and see if we have any questions about what we've talked about with our fluids so far. Or you can shoot me an emoji if you're feeling fine. Hayden asked a good question. Um, I like it, Roxana. Uh, Hayden asked a good question uh, about what kinds of things we would find in, uh, in cytosol. Um, so when we talk about cytosol having proteins, that's when some of those other functions that you all mentioned about proteins, 
that's where they come into uh, into play. So things like um, giving a cell its shape, the cytoskeleton stuff, that's some of, of the proteins that we see right here. They make up the cytoskeleton, giving the cell its shape. Um, or that's things like those enzymes, so helping a cell to do chemical reactions. So the reason I have so many proteins is because they're doing all those functions that were listed in your packet about what proteins do. Um, so that's the, the job of the proteins in cytosol, different from the job of the proteins that we see in plasma. Good clarifying question. Um, so Victor is asking with the, the recipe for, for plasma, um, plasma is going to be sodium chloride and the proteins. So it has, we can see it from our graph here, anything that's tall that's red is plasma. So we've got a lot of sodium, we still have a bunch of chloride, and then lots of those proteins as well. Whereas the interstitial fluid, what makes it different from plasma, it still has sodium, it still has chloride, but it does not have those proteins. Dr. Aulis is a teacher who loves to compare and contrast. So the fact that those fluids are really similar, except for the proteins, means that those proteins are important. Make sure we know that plasma has a bunch of proteins and that uh, interstitial fluid does not. That's an important idea to make sure we know. All right. <clears throat> For Professor, I have a question. Yes. So what makes it, like what, um, I'm not sure how to ask it, if it's, why would we count protein to be part of the plasma if it only has under 20? Like, is there a certain number that it, is supposed to go over on the chart or not necessarily yeah that's a, that's a good question um yeah so the question is this is not a very tall bar compared to our other bars why does that one get to count um that one gets to count because we're comparing it relative to each other um so what has the most proteins hands down is we would say is the interstitial fluid that's where or excuse me the intercellular fluid our cytosol has the most proteins absolutely Notice though how interstitial fluid has almost none. That makes it look like this bar is like way, way big. So if I ask you for what fluid has the most proteins, hands down, that's the cytosol. But my plasma has more, a lot more proteins than my interstitial fluid does. That's why it's worth mentioning for us. So yeah, good question. There's not necessarily a, a benchmark that we're using for these things except that when we look at how low it is in interstitial fluid, that makes it really important in plasma because it's much higher. So if that was a question on an exam and we didn't put proteins, because I did that one, I did plasma by myself, and I only put um, NA and CO. So if would you would we get marked off if we didn't put proteins? You would get partial credit for okay. that. Yeah, so we would just need to add in the proteins as well. Okay. Yeah. We, thank you. Yeah. We, yeah. You're welcome. Um, because the the big idea with this this whole recipes thing is I want you to know what the most important things are in each of these fluids, um, and and so what makes interstitial fluid different from plasma is the level of proteins. That's what makes it so important because that's the thing that's the most different between the two of them. So even though it's not as high, I totally get that, not as high as, uh, as it is in the cytosol, it is still important for us in this case. So great question. Any other questions? I'm looking all twitchy, right? Cause I'm looking over at my, uh, my other screen. Two screens are working today. That's it's much better for me this way. <laughs> okay, well, let me uh, show you if we take that graph and we turn it into uh, a picture of a very basic picture of a cell. When we look at that, you can see, remember, we said that on the outside of a cell, we had a lot of sodium and chloride because that was our fluids like interstitial fluid 
or plasma. And we said that on the inside of our cells, we have a lot of potassium in my cytosol. When we talk about sodium and chloride and potassium, these are things that have charges on them. And things that have a charge, my name for them as a group, is I call them ions. So generally, things with a positive or a negative charge, I call those things ions. But when I'm talking about things with a positive charge, so when I'm talking about sodium, or when I'm talking about potassium, I have a special name for my ions that have a positive charge. What was the special name for positively charged ions? Do we remember it for the positively charged ions? Yeah, exactly. So sometimes ions have a positive charge, and if they do, they're called a cation. Cations are things with a positive charge. Yeah, I like it. Roxana said that cats have paws. So a cation is positive. I love that. When we talk about things like chloride, chloride has a negative charge. So negatively charged things are called anions. Anions. We will talk about this more in lesson number three, but I, I always get the question, how do I form cations and anions? How do they get charges? The way that they get charges is when they give away or they receive extra electrons. So we've got these negatively charged things inside each of, of our atoms. They go in circles. If I give them away, I become a cation. If I get extra ones, I become an anion. So inside and outside of your cells, we have different amounts of different anions and cations. Because I have different amounts of positives and negatives inside and outside, the word that I use to describe my cells is I say that my cells are polarized. Polarized. We've got a different charge inside compared to my charge outside. Now, here is an underlying highlight star idea that I want to make sure that everybody writes down. So find a place, maybe somewhere near this picture, to write this down for me. Being polarized is a good thing. Being polarized is a good thing. Having a different charge inside compared to outside, that's good for my cell. Because soon we're going to talk about cells that change their charge to help them do things. So we've got to have a different charge inside compared to outside for us to be able to do things uh, like send a message if I'm a neuron or like contract if I'm a muscle cell. So all of your cells in your body are polarized. If they're not polarized, they're dead. So we want there to be different charges inside versus outside. That's what polarized means. Now, next to this picture in your notes, if you can find a place somewhere nearby or flip to your, your very last page, I want to end my time with you today with kind of a silly way to remember what's found where. So you don't have this in your notes, uh, but find a place in your notes where you can sketch yourself a little banana and write a couple things next to it. I'm going to talk with you about how our cells are kind of like salty bananas. So I'll give you a moment to, uh, to find a place to write things down. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention Lisa put a question in the chat um, about why sodium can be toxic in, in huge amounts. Um, it, it's, n it's kind of, it is related to this to a certain extent. Um, it, it's actually maybe more related to what we're going to talk about on Wednesday. Um, if I have more sodium than usual on the outside of my cell, so if I keep upping this a bunch, uh, what will actually happen is if I have too much salt on the outside, 
I'll end up actually stealing water from the inside of my cell. Um, either that or it'll make me so thirsty that I'll drink too much water and it'll put pressure on the inside of my cells. So we have to keep things balanced in our body to make sure that we have the right concentrations outside versus inside. If we don't, things go poorly. Uh, and that's actually something that you're reading about this week. Um, your application article for this week uh, is about something called water intoxication, where you can actually drink so much water that it can kill you because it messes up the concentrations of our cations and anions. So yeah, anything that, uh, that messes with our balance of these ions is problematic, like sodium, chloride, potassium, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, good correlation to make. Hopefully we've all drawn our bananas by this point. Let's have a discussion about how your cells are like salty bananas. And I, I have to give credit where credit is due. I did not come up with this on my own, uh, but my YouTube friend, Mr. Anderson, who you'll see some of his videos embedded in the guided lessons, this is an idea from him. So when you think about your cell, like a salty banana, imagine taking a banana and you sprinkled some salt on the outside of it. When I talk about salt, if I'm a chemistry teacher, does anyone happen to know uh, what the chemical formula for salt is from your, your chemistry class? Dust off some chemistry cobwebs, right? Do we happen to know the chemical formula for salt? Exactly. Yep, the chemical formula for salt is sodium chloride, NaCl. If I took some table salt, and I sprinkled it on the outside of a banana, I'm putting sodium and chloride on the outside of, of the banana, just like we have a bunch of sodium and chloride on the outside of our cells. If I look inside a banana, bananas have similar things inside of them, just like a cell. Bananas are really high in potassium. That's one of the reasons you might eat a banana for extra potassium. The other reason you might eat a banana, though, is if you're diabetic, what else do bananas have a lot of inside of them that someone who's diabetic might care about? Yeah, exactly. They've got sugar, right? Specifically that glucose that our cells like. Cells love glucose. I'm going to ask you that multiple times this semester. A cell's favorite food is glucose. It's the easiest to break down to make energy out of. So cells favorite food, glucose. So it's gonna hoard it and hoard it and hoard it. Bunches of glucose on the inside, bunches of potassium as well. The other thing that we could say is inside this banana, cause it's a, it's a special banana. It's like the perfect banana. If we had the perfect banana, uh, the perfect banana might also have protein in it. Alas, I, I have not found a banana that has protein in it, but if it was ideal, this ideal salty banana would have sodium and chloride on the outside. It would have potassium and glucose and proteins on the inside. So throughout the semester, when we're doing neurons, when we're doing muscles, I'm gonna keep pulling up this salty banana. We're gonna get really good at drawing salty bananas. Use it to help you remember that I've got salt on the outside of my cells, sodium chloride, and I've got glucose and potassium on the inside of my cells. That's all I've got for today. Any questions about ions, about the salty banana, about those things before we dive in to our group work? My lab friends know that Dr. Aulis made the rooms for class and then Microsoft Teams was like, just kidding, we're not going to put anybody in there until you're in class and you have to do it yourself. So I am frantically dividing us for those groups. Thank you for your patience.
I'm glad that it's taking me this long because it means everyone came to class today. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> all right, let me go back to my chat while it's assigning. Make sure we were all very quiet, except for Hayden's question. Yeah, Jamel is completely right. When we talk about anions versus cations, it all comes down to those electrons. And we will learn more than you ever want to know next week uh, about those things. But yes, um, if I'm going to have an anion, something with a negative charge, they have an extra negative that's spinning around them, an extra electron. If I've got something with a positive charge, they gave one of their electrons away to, to our anion friend. So absolutely right, Jamel. Excellent. All right, let me pull up for you our group activity. Just like last time, we're going to use a Google form for this. I'm going to put it into the chat so that everyone can open it up. Only one person from your group has to submit it. Uh, but this way you all have a chance to see those questions. So here is the form. Uh, Kaden asked one more, or Hayden, excuse me, asked one more clarifying question about a cation gaining or losing an electron. Um, cations lose an electron. That's, uh, that's how they become positive. They lose an electron. All right, so I put into the chat um, the the link to the Google form for today. I want to show you all how you can share your screen with each other. Uh, for my friends in lab today, did it go any better in, in group work? Were you better able to share your screens today? I didn't go into any groups, but I was watching your chat. Were we able to share? Okay, at least one of my groups was. Okay, so, so let me try to show you. Hopefully most of us can. We might not all be able to, but let me show you how to do it. Here's my screen, what I see with you all. Notice that right up here next to my leave button, there's this white box. When you're in your group, the white box is gonna have an arrow pointing up. If you click on uh, that, that arrow pointing up box, it'll give you the option, it'll drop down here that says you can share your screen. So whoever in your group is gonna be typing your answers, click on that white box with the up arrow, it'll give you the option to share your screen and uh, that will make it so that all of your group members are able to see what you're doing. Please use those mics. Uh, you can always type answers. Uh, yeah, Jaquandra talked about we just used our microphones. That honestly, if you can't get it to share, just talk to each other. Like that honestly may be the easiest way to do it. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop our recording and I'm gonna work on opening up those groups. Uh, but again, if you have any issues with the Google form, type it in your chat. I do watch those chats while you're in there. <laughs> 